forget. For those of you who are new to our webinars, welcome to uh, our free monthly webinars. Like we uh, probably have talked to you about at some point in the past, we uh, we do a free webinar every month. We change up the topic, we address questions that are that our clients have or that we've come up through the different assessments and things that we've been doing, trying to uh, help our clients figure out what, um, address the answers essentially to their questions. So we are always looking for new questions and new thoughts. So if you ever have a question that pops up that you'd like some input on, you think might make a good webinar, please email us. Uh, we could always use to spice things, spice things up every once in a while. Uh, that said, uh, if you've been on our website recently, we are uh, just uploading our second half webinars. So the July webinar is up there now, uh, and the rest of them should be going up this week. They're all been preset now. So uh, just if you're looking to register for one of our upcoming webinars, uh, just give us a couple more days, and then they should all be up on the website ready to go, and you can register for whichever ones uh, pique your interest. So uh, once again, welcome to our webinar this morning. Um, just some uh, housekeeping things. If you do have some questions, please uh, shoot those to me in the question box that's available there. I, uh, I have that open on my screen and they should pop up in front of me so I can address those questions as we go. I am, generally speaking, I mean, as informal as I can be in a webinar, it's hard when I can't see you, but uh, I, do, I will ask, answer those questions sort of as we go along if that's a, a good fit for the flow of this session today. And if not, I'll hold on to it till the end. But uh, if if you do send it to me, I should see it and be able to respond. I have already had a, a couple questions about uh, if we can send out the slide decks, will we be sending them out? Um, and that is something that we uh, we actually have chosen not to do any longer. We find that the slide deck doesn't mean a whole lot without the actual content, my descriptions going along with it. So instead, we record all of our webinars and we send those recordings out after the fact. So you can access this webinar again and again in the future, listening to what we've had to say that goes along with the slides that, uh, you know, or of particular interest to you. So you'll have a chance to go back and review that uh, at a later date. But we will send that out uh, likely today, if not today, uh, in the next day or so, depending on how quickly I get it up and posted on YouTube. So. So that said, you're here with us today to talk about sit-stand workstations. Uh, we want to talk about what are our options and when are they required. And this webinar topic uh, stems from a huge increase in requests for sit-stand workstations. Um, it's quite uh, remarkable how many requests that we are getting. And then trying to, our clients really are struggling on multiple levels. They're struggling because uh, they don't know, A, if the employee even needs it or not. That's sort of factor number one. Uh, and it's a, and a sign relatively significant expense, potentially, as if the employee doesn't need it, that's a problem, right? Uh, so that's step one. Step two, uh, we'd be looking at, uh, so, yeah, so sorry, step one is that do they even need it or not? Step two is if they do need it, what the heck one do they need? Because there are literally hundreds of these popping up online. Uh, uh, you can see them on a whole bunch of different websites. There's tons of different options out there. Which one is a good fit for your employee? Because they aren't all created equal. And it's not even just created equal in terms of quality, uh, how they adjust, what kind of range of movement they have, whether the screens adjust independently of the keyboard, uh, can they accommodate two screens or one screen? There's a lot of different variables that go into making an educated decision about what uh, option you want to select and then within that, or sort of what type you want to select, and then within that, which of the options available in that, uh, in that style. So we're going to explore some of those things today. If you have questions, like I said, I think this is a hot topic right now. I just had a conference last week, and lots of people were asking me questions about this. So please shoot me those. I'll try and address them as we go. So I want to start briefly by talking about uh, the media hype element of this, that your employees are hearing, as are you, that sitting's the new smoking, sitting is killing us, it is a huge health risk to be sitting for as long as we are. So I want to pull up a few of those headlines and talk about sort of what that means, because we know the media hypes things up and they're sensationalizing this because, like, they do everything, right, because that sells papers or sells ad time or whatever it is, right? So we need to talk about briefly what are the, what's the hype, what are the headlines, and then get really down to sort of the more details. What are the health risks associated with sitting? What is sort of the actual coming out of the research positive and negatives out of sitting for, you know, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve hours a day? 
then we want to spend the bulk of our time talking about the different options because I know that's what you're here to, to hear about. Um, and then we're going to finish by talking about reducing the risk. Besides getting someone a sit-stand workstation, what the heck else can we do to reduce the risk that's associated with sitting for prolonged period of times? Because I'm not going to pretend that there isn't risk. There definitely is. So starting off with media hype and headlines, this next slide is going to share with you a few of the headlines that you've likely seen, heard, or been had someone allude to over the last year, year or two anyways. So you've got some new ones up there, health hazards of sitting, sitting is, you have sitting disease. Sitting disease is sort of a term that was coined a couple years ago, uh, and it's about, obviously, the, the duration of time you spend sitting. Um, dangers of sitting at work, and I like this one, so the second one at the bottom there, and standing, uh, because I think that's the message that I want to send. One of the messages I'd like to send today is that you also don't want to stand all day, right? That that's something that I, I frequently have to deal with employees. They they come with a doctor's note or they've come to their employer and said, you know, my doctor says I need to stand at my workstation. And so I need a standing workstation as their request. But when you actually start talking to them, a standing workstation is not appropriate either because think about what it feels like to stand all day. If you've ever worked an event of any kind, if you've ever stood behind a booth uh, or, you know, even worked a garage sale, for heaven's sakes, right, that it is not easy to stand all day either. So we spend, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day sitting, fine, but if we flip that to being six, seven, eight hours a day standing, are we doing as much uh, damage? And if if not, how close are we, right? Is it really to our advantage to stand all day, right? And so there's there's all kinds of headlines and information out there, but these are some of the ones that have been catching uh, catching sort of the biggest attention. I think probably number, the first one up there is the biggest, sitting the new smoking. We've heard that, heard that a lot. So some interesting stats for you. Uh, sitting for long stretches, more than six hours a day, can make someone at least 18% more likely to die from diabetes, heart disease, and obesity than those sitting less than three hours a day. And this is from a journal, right? So it's research-based. It's an interesting, uh, an interesting sort of conclusion point uh, for many reasons, not the least of which is that uh, people who sit less than three hours a day are obviously significantly more active, so they're going to reduce their risk of, uh, of disease. I don't know know many office folks that sit less than three hours a day. There aren't too many people that work in an office-based environment that sit that infrequently. So uh, interesting, yes, but how does it apply to our office environment? I'm not, as, I'm not as confident that this is realistic, that we can get down to less than three hours a day. And this study wasn't evaluating the comparison between sitting less than three hours versus standing, right? So if we go from sitting seven to eight hours a day and then we shift that to standing for seven to eight hours a day, are we seeing that same 18% reduction or sorry, 18% increase? It, we might be, right? Because we aren't actually moving, which is really the benefit, right? Those people less sitting less than three hours a day are likely moving for many of those other hours, which is where your significant health benefit comes from. This is just sort of a general statement, but Canadian adults spend three quarters of their waking hours each day sitting or reclining. Think about your day yesterday. Think about your day this morning, right? You probably got up at, you know, five, six, seven o'clock and you, it's, you know, it's now 1030. I know myself, I've been in the office since just after seven this morning. So three and a half hours and I have gotten up from my chair probably twice to make myself a coffee, go grab a water, maybe run to the bathroom, right? I have basically sat for the last three and a half hours. So if you look at the previous slide, I've already exceeded my sitting limit for the day compared to those other individuals, right? And I think this is pretty standard, right? Not only do we sit at work, but one of the biggest issues I think that our society experiences is not that we sit necessarily at work, although that's certainly potentially an issue, but also that we sit in our in our downtime as well, right? When you go home from work, a lot of folks will sit. We'll sit for dinner. We'll sit and watch some TV uh, in the evening. We might sit out back. Uh, if you, you've got nice some nice weather in the summertime, you might sit outside. But much of that time is likely spent sitting. So not only do we sit while we're at work, but we compound that problem by sitting when we're at home as well. So let's briefly look at some of the health risks of sitting and standing, because I want to highlight them both. So let's start with effects of sitting. 
This is essentially what happens to our bodies while we sit. So the metabolism decreases 90% after 30 minutes of sitting. So we talk about, you know, obesity epidemics and other things that are happening in our society. And if we are sitting for seven or eight hours a day, our metabolism is dropping fast. And so we're not burning as many calories because we're not as active. So that's a significant problem. Our good cholesterol also drops after two hours of sitting. Again, most people are going to spend a couple hours of sitting uh, as part of their work day, right? So your good cholesterol is going to drop, so we increase our risk of heart disease and other things that way. We increase our risk of developing diabetes by double it, essentially. The average office worker sits 10 hours a day. And now this is a combination of home and away, right? But average walker, or average, excuse me, office worker sits 10 hours a day, right? Think about your day, right? Probably 10 hours is pretty reasonable. I would say there are some days I probably sit 12 or 14 hours if I count all my working time and dinner and sitting down, you know, to watch a, the Jays game in the evening or whatever. All of a sudden, 10 hours is probably on the low end of what I do. It also seems to double the risk of cardiovascular disease uh, for seated workers versus standing workers. There is increased risk from seated, sitting for cardiovascular disease, but the goal should be that we start to walk or move a little bit, right? I don't want to move to go from sitting just to standing. I want to build movement into my day. That's where you're going to get the absolute greatest benefit. So, uh, you know, some of the recommendations coming out are that we start by aiming to walk for two minutes every 20 minutes. So if you add this up to an hour of a day, every hour, we're looking at walking six minutes every hour. And this could be as simple as, going to get things from the photocopier, walking to a meeting, right? Those count as meeting as walking time, right? So if you can build up to six minutes every hour, then we're, you know, starting to combat the effects of those static seated postures. We also know that sitting is very sedentary, so no calorie burning, hence the risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we affect our digestive and our metabolic system, which I sort of highlighted on the previous slide. Oh, sorry, I've got a, something in the background. Hold on one second. Sorry, something took over there. I was speaking in the background quietly. <laughs> Hopefully that solves the problem. So other effects of sitting are low, lower muscle activation, decreased blood flow, right? So we know sitting's not great. That's not my message for today by any means. Uh, now we need to look at the effects of standing. How does standing, what happens to us while we stand at the workstation? So when we're standing, we're looking at the, uh, we're looking at the, the pros or the positives of standing are increased blood flow so and greater muscle activation. So by standing for prolonged periods of time, or standing as part of your work day, we're going to increase blood flow, we're going to increase our muscle activation, therefore we're going to increase our energy expenditure, right? So these things are really positive things for us. The cons here are fatigue, right? If you've stood all day like I alluded to before, you've probably experienced some pretty significant fatigue, right? It also can be increase the strain and pressure to our lower back, to our hips, to our legs and our feet. In particular, when you think about office workers, because these are not areas that they have traditionally experienced any strain on or very minimal strain on when they've been at work. When you look, think about an office worker, most of their injuries are in their upper body, right? Shoulders, elbows, wrists, etc. not in their low back. So it's increased the strain and the pressure to those areas, and which that may be compounded by the fact that uh, by the fact that they haven't been using those muscle groups for quite some time uh, while they're at their workplace. The real message, I think, has been that we should be start altering our postures back and forth. We want to actually change our position, right? The real, like I've said before, sitting, we're not meant to sit. We aren't really meant to stand either. The real way our body is built is actually to move, right? Our body is built to move. It's designed to move. And so the real benefit from a sit-stand option is actually frequent changes to, the, to your positioning. So changing from sitting to standing every 30 minutes to every hour, for example, right? That's going to start to create some movement, combat the effects of static sitting, uh, improve circulation, uh, improve productivity, because we tend to get re-energized when we change positions. So you see a lot of folks, when they're really sort of being creative, they're out walking, they're moving, because that helps them get creative and get engaged with what they're working on. Same, the, some of the benefits of rotating between sitting and standing can be found there as well. 
So that's enough of sort of the summary of what the benefits are. I want to get into sort of the nitty gritty of what are the options for sitting and standing because there are many, many, many options on the market. So I've kind of broken them down into three different categories uh, based on fully height adjustable desks, desk add-ons, which I'll show you in a moment if you haven't seen yet. And then the third option is sort of a, a hybrid where someone, is, some companies have used, started to use keyboard trays and, and mounts and monitor arms and things to allow you to adjust that equipment up and down uh, to seated and standing heights. So let's start with probably the one that everyone's most familiar with, because this was the traditional, was a fully height adjustable desk. So the fully height adjustable desk, the whole workstation adjusts, right? So in this case, the whole workstation adjusts right, up and down, and so you typically it adjusts in one of two ways. It either cranks up and down, so there's a manual crank at the side, or it, uh, or it can be raised or lowered um, with a, like a, electronically, right, there's a button there that can be raised or lowered. And not all height adjustable desks are created equal, right, so things to watch for when you're considering this as a, an option for one of your employees or perhaps for a retrofit of your entire workstations, uh, is to look at adjustability range, right? When, we're, when we want to, essentially price typically goes up with the more adjustability that you have. So the higher price tag will give you lots of range of motion, perhaps more than you need, right? That's something to be thoughtful of is how much range of motion uh, do you actually need in this desk? How high does it need to go? How low does it need to go? And we can help you figure that out. There are some anthrometrics, uh, which are just like bo sort of standardized body sizes and shapes, which can help you figure out what a you know, sort of small female seated elbow height would be, which would be the low end. You want your keyboard tray to accommodate your small females. Uh, and then you can also look at how tall a standing elbow height would be for a male, for a tall male. And that would sort of be sort of your maximum range that you would want to go to. And then from there, you're going to sort of shrink that range down depending on your population or depending on your cost and your budget. You might sacrifice some of that extreme range to fit within your existing system. So when you're looking at adjustable desks, you want to definitely evaluate the range. Uh, this is particularly true um, as you start to look at your lower price points. You really want to make sure that it gives you the range that you need. So for example, uh, my husband has recently started working from home a couple days a week. And uh, as part of that, we, I, we bought him a sit-stand workstation for his office uh, here. And it, uh, it came from Costco, actually. So of all places, Costco offers a height-adjustable option for several of their desks, which is great. But looking at the range of adjustability here um, is important because it might, I'm, if you haven't ever met me before, I'm quite short. <laughs> I'm only five foot two. And so my elbow height when I'm sitting and truly in my best ergonomic position, my elbow height is like 24 inches from the ground, which is significantly shorter than a standard desk is. Uh, and so the desk from Costco that my husband is using doesn't even come close to meeting my adjustability height, right? I needed to go down to 24, maybe 25 inches, somewhere in that range, uh, and it only goes down to, say, 29 or 29 and a half inches. So it works fine for my husband, who is 6'2 and long torsoed, would be a terrible fit for me at 5'2 with a 24-inch uh, elbow height when I'm sitting. So it's something to definitely watch out for, that the adjustability range I don't want you to go and buy a height adjustable desk because, in quote unquote, it's the gold standard when really, uh, without doing the research, you may not actually get what you need, right? It may, you may still be adding things to this desk like keyboard trays and other items to try and lower it down for your smaller population. It is important that you're considering how it adjusts. Uh, if you're going to ask your employees to adjust or rotate back and forth between sitting and standing frequently, like every hour perhaps, or every half hour, sort of is the guideline that you're suggesting to them, it needs to be very simple to use, right? So a crank adjustable desk, for example, not a good choice. It's going to not be used because it's too difficult and too, like there's too much force required, awkward posture. Um, it's just too manual and it takes too much time. So your employees are not likely to use use a crank, a height of adjustable desk. 
probably the only employee that we motivated by that would be as somebody who has an injury. And then that's a problem too, because now I have somebody who has some kind of shoulder injury or back injury, and they're highly motivated to move between sitting and standing. But the problem is now that they, um, that they have to crank it manually. So someone with a back injury shouldn't be doing a manual crank, right? So significant drawback here, I think, uh, most frequently and probably would have easily identified is the quality. Or, sorry, excuse me, is the cost, uh, is the cost of, these, of these workstations typically they carry the greatest price tag. They likely give you the sort of best, easiest ergonomic setup without worrying about a whole bunch of other features as long as you get the right height adjustment range. Um, but it's not very, you have to be very careful that it's compatible, right? That it, it works with your existing system. You need to talk to your, if you have a cubicle type system at your workplace, you need to make sure that someone uh, that you're connecting with your your furniture provider and figuring out if they have height adjustable desks, can they build in a portion of the desk that's height adjustable because size also plays a ma uh, factor. The bigger the desk, the more expensive, right? So sometimes they can take a piece out and make that piece height adjustable. And so you're going to work with them to figure out which one works best. That said, uh, one thing I should mention is that if you were doing this for an accommodation purpose, right, if you're going to go to a fully height adjustable desk for an accommodation, then you don't have to worry so much about full adjustability range. Uh, you can focus more on what are, the, what are the specific dimensions of that employee. So if you measure the employee's seated elbow height and standing elbow height, that's the range that your desk needs to move through. So if you're looking at specifically for accommodation, you might be able to shrink that adjustability range, which might shrink your cost a little bit, in order to make it fit for that specific individual. The next one I want to highlight is the idea of a sit-stand option. So this is a desk-mounted option, uh, and these ones have cropped up with extreme popularity in the last uh, few years, and there are tons of different options out there. I've sampled a few here uh, on my slide today, but there are many, 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 many out there, and I feel like every ergonomic company, every ergonomic product company is scrambling to get their own version up and running. So. The, the most interesting thing about these uh, is that they are very portable, right, that they, uh, they can be used as sort of a temporary accommodation, and I have some clients using them that way right now, that they are actually, they have, say, three of them at their, at their work site, and if someone uh, comes back with a doctor's note that says that they need a sit-stand workstation, um, the uh, health and safety department is very clear that this is a temporary accommodation uh, so that they will bring it in, they will provide it for them short term, and then as soon as uh, their injury, they've recovered from their injury and their discomforts, then the uh, sit-stand option may disappear, right? Unless it becomes a permanent restriction for that employee, the uh, sit-stand desk may disappear at that point. It's meant to be a temporary solution. So when you're looking at these, you want to make sure a few things. Uh, just like your sit-stand fully head adjustable desks, these adjust in many different ways. There are some that adjust with cranks, uh, and there are some that adjust as simply as just touching, like grabbing the platform and stand, like raising it up, and it will hold its position at the elevated height. And that's essentially something I want to, I want you to be thoughtful of when you're shopping around. That a crank adjustable uh, desk is not something that people adjust typically, right? You know that it takes too much time. Therefore, only a highly motivated individual is actually going to adjust that desk or that uh, desk mount. So we want to make sure that it is simply to, simple to adjust. So I would suggest you go with no knobs, no levers, just simply stand, lift it up, sit, lower it down, and the whole thing will work together as a unit. There's no knob to loosen or no lever to, to click off in order to allow that height adjustability to happen. Okay, so that's sort of step number one. You also want to make sure that the keyboard and the monitor adjust separately. So ideally, the monitor height can be adjusted independently of the, the keyboard so that, you know, everybody's torso length is different. Everybody's eye height and monitor and elbow height and everything is all unique. So I want to be able to adjust the keyboard to their elbow height and the top of the screen to their eye height. So you want to make sure that you can have all those uh, features working independently of one another so you can actually achieve good ergonomic positioning that way. 
So probably the biggest benefit to these ones right now is the cost. So if you're uh, you typically your sort of height adjustable, fully height adjustable desks are probably looking at the thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range, maybe even more, depending on what furniture company you work with and how much range you're getting. These ones probably go as low as about four hundred dollars, uh, and as high as coming upwards of a thousand. I think eight eight hundred is probably sort of on the the higher end, eight to nine hundred dollars. So there is a lower price point on these, which is why they're catching on like wildfires that somebody needs head adjustability, this is a good way to get it without carrying the full price tag of your adjustment option, of your fully adjustable desk. It is simple to adjust, it does go on and off easily, uh, and the quality of these have typically been very good. One of the biggest, there's a couple sort of major factors to consider for me when you're looking at these desks, uh, these desk add-ons, is number one, uh, whether the keyboard goes below the desk height. So, this one is particularly important for uh, so your smaller population. The number of uh, females in particular I see when I go to assessments who are working on the desktop and that is much too high for them is really high. And so when you're looking at these, you want to consider whether you need something that drops below the desk height or not. So there are some of these, okay, so I've got two pictures that do and two pictures that don't. So if you're on my slide right now, looking at the uh, human scale and the very desk on the right-hand side, neither of those models are designed to go below the desk. Both of them, that keyboard platform, lowers down and sits flush or maybe even an inch or so above the desk height. So if you have a small employee who needs a keyboard tray or who... Uh, should have a keyboard tray or at least should be able to work below the desk height, uh, those options are not going to be suitable, uh, which is unfortunate. The, the very desk in particular carries the lowest price point of all these at the moment, as far as I've seen anyways, um, somewhere in that $400 range. So it becomes a very popular option because it's pr reasonably, pr very reasonably priced. The problem with the very desk uh, is that it doesn't go below the desk. So if you have someone who's too short, it's not going to be a good solution for you, and you need to start shopping for other other options. You can look on the left there, and these are just a couple examples. There are many more out there, but the Ergotron and the Taskmate that are both demonstrated there, uh, both of those drop below the desk. And what I mean by that, I mean the keyboard actually goes below the desk, much like a keyboard tray would, right? So if you lower the Ergotron down, if you lower that platform down, it'll drop down maybe four to, I'm not exactly sure the dimensions off the top of my head, but let's say four to six inches below the desk height. So for someone who's short, this would allow them to lower that uh, keyboard right down to their elbow height, and then when they're ready to stand, they can raise it up and it'll be in line with their desk. Right, so that's sort of the major, uh, major one major factor to consider. The other major factor, factor to consider for me is one of the challenges with these desk mounts is how you mount two screens. If you have a single screen, it's no problem. But if you have two screens, we what I want from an ergonomic perspective is one screen to be directly in front of you, right? They call that your primary screen. And I want your secondary screen to be off to the right or to the left. And so in order to achieve that in a, uh, in well, really, in the way that these desk mount options are set up, you can't easily achieve that, right? That if you look at the human scale as my example up there, the monitors are always mounted equal on any kind of arm-based system. So like the human scale, like the Ergotron that has sort of a single arm in the center at the back, the monitors are always uh, mounted equally. The Taskmate is a little bit more flexible because it allows you to put your screens however you like, but generally speaking, there's not enough room on that platform to properly accommodate both screens with one in front and one off to the side, right? Especially if you have any kind of widescreen monitor, there's not likely to get your, um, to get your screens mounted or positioned properly on there. And the, same, the very desk can be quite big depending on which model you choose, so it is the closest to getting those screens correct. Uh, but it, you have to go to quite a large model to make that happen, and as you already know, it doesn't go below the desk, so that eliminates a lot of people from that being a practical solution. <clears throat> so I've got a good question coming in here that says, what would be medical reasons for a doctor or a WSIB to recommend sit-stand desk versus walking six minutes per hour? Great question. Um, <laughs> That's a great question, and it has a, um, a complicated answer. So the short-term answer is that uh, doctors often recommend sit-stand um, knowing that 
well, both cases, let's say, we'll go from, from a sort of a grander perspective. We know that getting an employee to change their work methods, like walking or taking short breaks from their workstation, five or six minutes of every hour, um, sounds simple, but is not something that is easily changed, right? If that's not their natural habit, then they're not likely to just walk away, remember to walk away from their workstation regularly. So it's like an administrative control, uh, whereas this, a, a desk add-on or a fully uh, adjustable desk are more of an engineering control. And I'm using that tongue-in-cheek because employees can still never adjust them. They could get a sit-stand desk and never stand, right? They could always sit. But uh, so that makes it still there's some administrative piece to this but it is more of an engineering control, giving them the tools they need in order to stand more frequently. Um, and then, you know, from a productivity perspective, some of our employers like this idea because the employees don't have to walk away from their desk, right? So they don't lose those five minutes or 10 minutes of an hour that they're actually out moving, which I, I disagree with, but I can appreciate where they're coming from. Um, and so hopefully that answers your question. I think medically, uh, most frequently we see um, the people I specifically recommend keep a sit-stand desk or get a sit-stand desk usually are very injury specific. So someone who has been in a very serious injury is in a lot of pain while sitting, uh, for example, a uh, sit-stand desk is a good option for those individuals because it does give them more flexibility and more range. Uh, but oftentimes, I think a, a, a recommendation like that, especially from a doctor or someone who's never been to the workplace, is short sighted because their ergonomic their their back injury or back discomfort might be directly related to the fact that their chair is poorly adjusted and there's no lumbar support right so making an adjustment to their chair might solve their lower back discomfort without actually even having to go to a sit stand option and i saw this the other day i went in to do an assessment for someone at a, a local township and i um they had a doctor's note that said that they needed a sit-stand workstation. And after talking to this individual for a while, I said, you know what? I don't think a sit-stand option is the right fit for you. And she said, oh, really? Can you? She goes, I was wondering too. Can you talk to me about why? And so we went through all the reasons. And she described someone, she described her job as, Yes, she works on the computer often, but she also is up and moving quite regularly, getting printing, running to her neighbor, going to meetings, etc. She easily spends five to ten minutes an hour out of her workstation and not sitting, just in the movement that's built into her day. So a sitting and standing desk isn't necessarily going to get her any more benefit from that. Uh, good. Next question is, is it recommended for the keyboard to be on a tray below your desk or leveled with your monitor on the same surface. So I, I'm going to interpret that question to uh, mean is the Ergotron sort of style a better option versus the very desk style? And that answer uh, I can't give you actually because it really depends on the individual. So uh, for me it's essential that the keyboard goes below the desk height. Uh, for other folks they might easily be able to work on the desk and then have the keyboard, the monitor on the same platform as well as the keyboard and that would be fine. It really depends on the individual's body size and shape, which is why so many people are struggling about what sit-stand option to get because they're still trying to figure out uh, how to solve the problem, right? If you have a fully height adjustable desk, then they can be on the same surface. If your monitor needs to go a little higher, you can put a, key, a monitor stand in there and that would solve the issue. Oh, lots of questions today. Okay, so what are the most popular brands you typically recommend um, vendors I use? Uh, okay, so I'm going to assume that you're talking about the desk mount add-ons, and Katya, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the most popular brands that uh, good, cool, and blah, blah, blah. I, I'm going to tell you my favorite brands, um, and then we can, we can go from there. There isn't necessarily one that's better than the other in particular. Uh, the Ergotron, uh, for example, is one I recommend often, uh, and mostly because of its availability. It is, uh, it's easily, it's accessible. Uh, you can purchase it online through Staples and other vendors that our clients typically use. So we do recommend, um, we do recommend that one often. It also has some interesting adjustability for a dual monitor setup. Uh, it's a little bit better than some of those ar other ARM ones to try and accommodate the screens in the right position. So I do recommend that one often. Uh, I also recommend the human scale one. It really depends on whether the client uses human scale or not. Uh, and, this, and the very desk one we recommend, uh, because it's got a good price point, we recommend it often if, it, if the employee can work on the desktop. 
So I'm not sure that answers fully answers your questions. There are tons of brands out there. Uh, the one I don't have pictured on here is actually the Winston, and that's more similar to the Ergotron style. Uh, there's also one called the Kangaroo, which I don't see very often, but is quite adjustable as well. So there are there are so many of them on the market, it's hard for me to even give you a, 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 a truly good, thorough answer to that question. I will say that I recommend the ones that I see most often, that I have seen most frequently at trade shows and events and things. Someone's asked if I've looked at Populous or Ergo Prize height adjustable desks, and I have not currently looked at those products, so I can certainly do that and give you some feedback if you would like. Uh, just remind me after, shoot me an email, I can happily do that. Uh, is there any medical disadvantage to standing that we should look for? I think really the, the thing about standing is about, the, is about the duration. One of the things that we hear a lot from folks who stand, who go to a sit-stand desk, is that they also uh, want or find that they need a uh, uh, anti-fatigue matting underneath their feet. That if they're going to stand for a significant chunk of their day, and think about someone with a, an injury from a car accident, for example, that's a common, uh, that's sort of a common type of injury that I might recommend recommend a sit-stand workstation for. You see a lot of folks with back and neck injuries that are having a hard time sitting for prolonged periods of time. And so if that's the case and we go to a, a standing desk, then uh, uh, anti-fatigue matting is something that we often look for to combat some of the negatives of standing, which are the, the fatigue associated with standing. In terms of medical disadvantages, aside from fatigue and some additional strain to the lower body, uh, there's not, uh, not as much, uh, certainly not as many drawbacks to that. Okay, so I think if you have more questions about desk mount options, please ask. I think that's the one that most people are looking at and probably we're here to see. <clears throat> but make sure that you just continue to throw those questions out and I will come back to them at the end. So the third option you might go to is a keyboard tray. Oops. The third option you might go to is a keyboard tray and monitor arm. So instead of getting a fully head adjustable desk, perhaps, or a desk mount option, perhaps you can get a couple pieces of equipment that, <coughs> pardon me, that would allow you to raise and position your equipment uh, into the right into the right location. So you could. You can look at sort of the bottom right hand or the bottom two pictures there. There's a keyboard arm and there's a monitor arm in the picture on the right, both of which are designed to allow you to have a significant vertical range of motion here. So the goal is to get you up quite high uh, from your desk so that you could sit and have yourself at elbow height and stand and get yourself as close to elbow height as possible in the standing position. So the the drawbacks here are definitely limited height range, right? So someone who is shorter would be better suited to this style. Someone who is six foot two is never going to fit this. You're never going to find, at least I have never found, a keyboard tray that an accommodated standing position uh, that is, you know, 10 or 12 inches above the desk. And the monitor arms may have better range of motion, but are still going to be pretty limited. The other drawback to this are tasks performed, right? If you have someone who has a lot of paperwork and items they reference on the desk, we can accommodate those in a fully head adjustable desk or a desk mount option, depending on which features you're looking at. When you look at someone who's getting a fully adjustable keyboard platform and monitor, there is no place to put paperwork that is at your standing height. So if you are going to reference paperwork a lot as part of your job or your employee will, you'll find that they tend not to stand when they are doing paperwork related tasks because it is a bit tricky uh, in order to in order to figure out where to put it really so that it's easily it, you can easily see it while you're working. Probably this is the least expensive option, which is why it can be attractive, uh, attractive way to sort of get to sitting and standing. And you may already have some pieces of equipment that are highly adjustable. For example, you might already have a keyboard tray like the Cobra. We see the Cobra quite often. It's an ergonomic accessories keyboard arm. And it goes up above the desk several, uh, I think the range, and I'd have to be double check this to be you know absolutely certain, but I think it goes up almost seven inches above the desk, which is probably one of the highest ones that we see out there. Um, and it's a keyboard tray, so it's not, a, you know, it doesn't carry a massive price tag. It can be a little bit easier to swallow when you're getting that set up. And they're relatively easy to use. The only drawback here is you have to adjust two things, not one, right? You have to raise your keyboard up and your monitor up, which can be a drawback. So let me just add like a couple more questions coming in here. So someone has, 
who should, uh, oh, I'm getting a whole bunch of questions. Hold on, let me back up here. So who should make the decision if an employee needs a sit-stand station if there's no doctor's note? That's a great question, and that's a, that's a policy-related question. You'll need to make a decision about what your policy on sit-stand workstations is. Um, and we have a lot of clients that are sort of fine-tuning their policies at the moment based on the demand that they've been seeing. So I, I'm going to say that we have a whole range of different options. I have uh, clients who um, as, who require a doctor's note. So if they come, an employee comes to you know HR or health and safety and says I need a sit stand workstation, my back is sore, then they require a doctor's note. And the employee is sent to go get one. Uh, but we know that an employee can probably get a doctor's note for that. Uh, they can go to their doctor, tell them they need a sit stand workstation. They're probably going to get a, a prescription for that. Right, so that doesn't necessarily answer the question either. And a lot of our clients are moving to sort of phase two, which is that once you have a doctor's note, now that prompts an ergonomic assessment. So there are a lot of times that I make, I go in and I don't recommend a sit stand option, at least not as the first step. I think that by the time I've made some adjustments to a chair and a keyboard or whatever pieces of equipment that employee has, I, find, I, I believe that their discomfort is being caused by other issues or other factors at their workstation. So I often make adjustments and then from there, if I agree or if one of the ergonomists on my team agree that they need a, a, a sit-stand workstation, then that becomes step two. So it's almost a multi-phase approach. Step one is they must get a doctor's note to say that they do require this. Step two is they have an ergonomic assessment done to evaluate uh, whether we agree with that opinion or not. Because sort of the doctor's role is to look at the employee's um, physical health, right, and whether sitting is a good option for them, and then it, it becomes the ergonomist rule to evaluate is the workstation properly adjusted to fit them, and if not, is that, in my opinion, is that going to solve the issue, uh, and if it isn't, what are the next steps? Sometimes it can be as simple as rearranging the employee's workday so that there are more uh, I'm going to say, quote, unquote, more breaks built in. So they, you know, do some filing in the morning. They get up out of the chair, do filing after lunch. They have a meeting typically in the morning. Does that break their day up enough that a sit-stand workstation isn't going to give them a whole lot of additional benefit? That's sort of where the ergonomic assessment comes in. So uh, I think every client is handling this differently. So I'm going to say, uh, sort of say that sort of on the out front or on the, the closing out there, but those are sort of the two traditional ways that I'm seeing it, is that most clients are requiring a doctor's note at the very least, and if not, they are requiring an ergonomic assessment uh, because this is an epidemic. So we're finding that once one employee gets a sit-stand option, all of a sudden there's three more people out of the woodwork that are like, oh, so-and-so has one. That looks like interesting. Sitting's killing me, so I should have one too. And all of a sudden you get five more requests, and it can be a slippery slope to, to get traction on. So most most clients we're working with right now are developing a policy, just like they. You may have a policy on, you know, ex exercise balls in the workplace. Same concept here, developing a policy. Uh, okay. Oh, somebody's just giving me a tip here, saying other than a table with a manual crank and electrical, there's also a table with a counterweight that can manually and easily move up and down. Do I recommend that product? Uh, and yes, that's totally fine as well, as long as it. The force, uh, the force isn't significantly high, and the ones I've seen like that, that so these aren't electrical, fully adjustable tables. They're not crank. They're not electrical. Uh, they're actually counterweighted, so they you could just lift them up and down, just like you would the keep the desk mount add-on. Um, and yes, those would be fine as well, as long as they are you know functioning properly and not difficult to move. Then there's no reason not to. Uh, Okay, that was one question, and then somebody's asked me another question about a full desk. What's your opinion of electric adjustments with a hydraulic style like the Ergotron? Okay, I think that's the same question as before. That is totally fine um, if, you know, as long as everything's working and functioning. Do I have a manufacturer supplier in mind? Uh, I don't in particular. We try and uh, we when we work with clients, we work with their vendors as much as possible. So I don't. I do have some folks that we have worked with in the past, and I can happily send some names over to you uh, if you'd like them. But at the we don't have any particular vendor that we work with. Oh, and Anne is mentioning neither monitor looks like they are positioned correctly, and I agree. I don't think either of these. Sort of, we're talking about these three M the 3M keyboard arm, so the pictures of those two women there at the bottom in the center, I agree, neither of those are positioned properly. Uh, and that's just pictures I found online. Uh, if you are able to get the monitors up high enough, 
then you certainly can achieve good ergonomic posture this way as well. I could these in my not always are the the demo pictures from the, the companies proper ergonomics. So in this case, they show that there's a height range, but not necessarily the proper position. Because I agree, both monitors should be up high enough that they're in line with your eye height. Excellent questions this morning, you guys. Keep me keep me on my toes here. So in an effort to continue uh, sort of managing our time here, uh, I'm just going to continue moving through the slides, but pop close more questions up if you have any as we go along here. So just like a keyboard tray is not necessarily essential to make something ergonomic, neither is a sit-stand workstation. Uh, I don't recommend them everywhere I go. I would say I recommend them for maybe 10% of the population, and that might be even high. I bet I don't even recommend them for 10%. I don't even think I recommend them for 10% of the population or 10% of the ergonomic assessments that I do. It's almost always connected to a doctor's note and discomfort uh, in order to, to manage that. Uh, somebody's asking a question, does the Ergotron require drilling holes into an existing desk? It does not. It sits, uh, the hum uh, most of these sit on the desk, uh, the human scale, the Ergotron, the Taskmate, and I'd have to look at the other one I had up there. Uh, oh, the very desk. Uh, yeah, none of those require any drilling. It literally sits on the desk and is, uh, it might clamp to the front edge, but it doesn't actually drill through the desk at all. So there's no damage to the existing desk, which is why it's so portable, uh, because it's also easily removed later but, uh, if you wanted to use it sort of as a temporary accommodation piece. Good question. So sit-stand workstation is not necessarily essential. Uh, it's not that common that I recommend them, but they can be a valuable tool that you have in your toolbox for temporary accommodations as well as for permanent accommodations for folks who have some significant injuries. So other ways to reduce the risk, and this is what when I, we've been doing a lot of training lately on office ergonomics, and I every training session I get requests or comments about sit-stand workstations. It's pretty much a guarantee. Uh, and so what I like to focus on is the idea that we need to reduce the risk in other ways. Sitting and standing, both stationary, are not ideal, right? They both uh, have some drawbacks. They're fatiguing. They're tiring. You can stand in incredibly poor posture just like you can sit in poor posture. So we want to focus on what other options there are that are out there, uh, what other sort of work method changes should employees be making. And we've been doing some workshops with employees about how to sort of helping them envision how they can build standing into their day and movement into their day, perhaps more importantly. Um, so the most recent research is actually been focused. So now that we've got this sitting as the new smoking, sitting's killing us. Uh, the actual now that we've got that sort of set up, we've uh, sort of the newest research has been about how much standing should we really be doing in a day, right? So what we're sort of now that we know that sitting's killing us, how much time should we spend sitting? How much time should we be standing? So the newest research coming out of the UK uh, was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and they're they were looking at how much time do we really need to spend standing in order to start to combat the effects of static sitting postures, of how terrible sitting is for us, etc. Uh, and in this case, they have suggested that we should be standing for a minimum of two hours per workday, which is for most employees approximately 25% of their workday. And that's a threshold, and that if you cross that threshold, then you're going to start to see the benefits of standing at work. Standing for 15 minutes or 20 minutes throughout your day is not going to give you the benefits and not going to combat the static seated postures. Right. So ideally, they're also suggesting their suggestion is uh, start with two hours, aim for two and work your way up as close as you can get to four. So if we can aim to stand uh, and move for approximately four hours of our workday, then that's sort of the magic balance where we're not working. The fatigue element isn't as significant here because we're not standing all day, but uh, we are uh, starting to get the health benefits of standing rather than sitting. So that's sort of the newest research focus has been on, okay, now we know that sitting's bad for us. Let's start to look at how, uh, how much sitting or how much standing should we be doing? What are we working towards? Because that's a legitimate question. So two hours sounds like a lot of time, and I work with employees on this. Uh, like I said, I've been doing workshops on it lately. So two hours is like you know an office employee who's chained to their desk, you know, admin assistant, for example, throughout their day. Two hours sounds like an astronomical amount of time, right? It may sound like an astronomical amount of time to you as well. So we started. We what we've been talking about with them is 
taking looks at their days. It might be a cool workshop for you guys even to do in-house, right? Is start sit with some folks and do a workshop on how do you get to two hours a day of standing? What does that look like? Have them break, you know, bring their calendar for the next two or three days and figure out where they're going to build standing in. What can they, what in their calendar can they do standing? Right? What can they move to a different style of meeting or a different technique so that they can now stand rather than sit? So two hours of standing might look like, based on some of the stuff that's coming out of my workshops, two hours of standing might look like uh, 30 minutes of walking uh, on campus, in your office, to or from a meeting, et cetera, whatever that, you know, depending on how your work site looks like. Right? And that, so 30 minutes of your day. So if you go to two or three meetings in a day and you work at a relatively large facility, it's easily, you know, two to five minutes of walking each time. That's, you know, 15, 20 minutes of walking without even thinking about it, right? Just going to and from your meetings. So making sure that, you know, you're setting up meetings in person so that you can actually, A, meet people in person, which is lovely, <laughs> and then B, you're actually uh, getting the benefits of walking there. Uh, take 30 minutes of breaks away from your desk. Uh, too many of our staff, too many of yourselves, likely, myself included some days, don't take breaks. So we walk away, we don't actually walk away from our workstation. So not only do we, you know, uh, sit and do seven and a half approximately hours of work throughout the day, we also th sit through our lunch. That extra half an hour we get, we work through that lunch or we sit during that lunch, right? Finding places that you can stand and get away from that desk, uh, even if it's just actually taking your breaks, is ideal, okay? If you can stand for some of your work, right? I often encourage employees to think outside the box. Can you stand while you are on the phone, while you're going, you know, when you're printing something, you're photocopying something, can you stand there and wait for it to be done? It, can you go to someone's office and stand in their doorway and have that conversation instead of calling them? If they're, you know, four or five doors down, go visit them, right? Don't shoot an email, don't call, go actually stand in their doorway and have that quick five minute break uh, and a conversation. Right? And then obviously you have meetings, et cetera. Uh, and we're seeing more and more people that are sort of adopting the idea that standing is, uh, more and more companies, I should say, that are adopting the idea that standing is appropriate during meetings. So people will often stand at the back of the room or step back. They may have even standing tables in their meeting room so they can park their laptop there and stand during the meeting and still participate. Uh, ways to sort of get around the idea that I need to sit during my office time and my meeting time, right? So get, get some of those benefits in. Okay, so other ways you can reduce the risk of static postures is to start to look at making chair adjustments, right? We say, you know, your chair is meant to fit you, and that is absolutely true, but it's also got movement in it, right? Use that movement to break up static sitting postures. Rotate your tasks. I gave you an example of someone who... Um, Someone who needs, you know, breaks up filing throughout the day into two or three chunks, right? That gives you an excuse to get away from your desk throughout the day. It's all productive time. You're still doing things that must get done, right? So, you know, don't sort of bulk all of your movement tasks together. If you have to do some filing and you have to deliver the mail to various offices and you, you know, need to go and talk to someone about something, um, we often try and be super efficient and do all those things at once because I'm up. And then when I sit down later, I can just sit down and dedicate that time to office-related work. But in reality, we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot because we're not taking the time to get away from our desk, right, and taking that rotational break at regular intervals. I already mentioned taking breaks. Drinking lots of water makes you need to go to the bathroom, so that gets you up frequently, which is great. Plus, it's nice and healthy, which is a good thing. Uh, stand up during telephone calls, which I mentioned on the previous slide. And then we're seeing some clients taking things in a slightly different direction. So consider way, you know, different options. People are very creative while they're not sitting. In fact, a lot of folks find they're a lot more creative and a lot more engaged and interested when they are walking, for example. So the weather right now has been beautiful lately, hasn't even been too hot, right? Does your meeting need to occur in an office? And in many cases, it doesn't. If you're going to have a, you know, a two-person meeting or even a three-person meeting, you may be able to do that while you're going for a walk. So keeping nice, comfy shoes in your office, going for a walk to have, you know, a 15 or 20-minute meeting throughout the day, you may find that has a significant, uh, significant benefit.
some uh, my business partner found this online, the walking meeting in progress, um, and that was actually stickers that this, some company handed out to their employees so that when they were doing a walking meeting, they could wear the sticker. It was like a, it was like on a lanyard. I don't think it was actually a sticker, but it was something that they could wear while they were doing a meeting so that if other people saw them while they were out and about, they wouldn't interrupt because they knew they were in the middle of a meeting while they were doing their, doing their walking. So they wouldn't get interrupted to just chit chat because they were actually, you know, doing their work, not on a break. Other things, simple things, photocopy one at a time, meet with colleagues, all of these get you out of your static seated posture. So I guess the message for this part here is that it's important to remember that we are other, there are other ways besides buying new equipment to get our employees moving throughout the day and start to reduce the risk of st prolonged static seated postures. A lot of this may require a culture change, so that's a pretty significant shift that may need to happen at some of your workplaces, but it is important that we consider this as an option, right? That perhaps, you know, your employees are already engaged or you have a really, like, a really fit, healthy, very active management team or a couple managers in particular that could spearhead this, progress, this process and start to really build walking and moving meetings and things throughout their day and encourage their staff to do the same. Right? If you have a champion for this kind of stuff at your workplace, it might be the way to go and avoid the most of the uh, sit-stand workstation or desk add-on or all those other things uh, for only the people who have very significant or specific injuries with you know, pre-existing conditions, surgeries, etc. Absolutely, sit-stand is the way to go. For other folks who are having lower back discomfort, maybe there are other ways to help uh, them build up the strength and the, reduce the effects of static sitting. And then working smarter goes sort of a summary of what we've been talking about. So uh, but I know I only have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to jump here into the questions because I've had a few more questions come in as I was talking. Um, so just jumping back here, uh, first question that I missed there, uh, are the monitors on an Ergotron add-on adjustable separate from the keyboard tray? Yes, they, are, they totally are. Um, and the other thing we like about the Ergotron model is that if I, if I have two screens, uh, you can't adjust the screens because for balance, they need to be equally balanced on that arm, but you can adjust the keyboard platform. There are multiple different mounting positions, so you can shift the keyboard platform left or right so that it's more, it's more, it's not perfect, but it's more closely in front of one of the screens. So those are sort of the two benefits of Ergotron that's been attracting us to that one lately. Uh, next question was, besides the need for users to have sit-stand options, what are some full range movements or exercises uh, to get the employee to move at their desk sitting or standing? Uh, that was a good question. That was a question from Dave. And um, uh, again, a little complicated. There are lots of good like office desk stretching sort of uh, resources that you can find online and certainly could use those. Uh, be, just be cautious that if you have somebody with a specific injury or discomfort, that you, I often recommend that they get stretches from their medical practitioner, especially if they've been seeing a chiropractor or a physiotherapist or massage therapist, which they usually tell me uh, as part of the assessment. I would like them to ask those professionals because they may have some very specific stretches that they would like them doing. So if you're looking to get some generic stretches, there are some fabulous tools online. If you're looking to, uh, to sort of address this with somebody who has some specific discomfort, um, I would encourage them to talk to their medical practitioner because what stretches are good for them might be very different than stretches that are good for someone else. Uh, another question here that says, this is not pertaining to the sit-stand, but you mentioned the monitors and how they should be set. If there are dual monitors, one should be centered and one in, uh, on the eye that's the dominant side. I tend to caddy corner them when I and put the on the keyboard. On this one. Teddy category, caddy corner them and put the on the keyboard in the center of this so that the employee is center and still has the main screen for the eye that is dominant. Uh, that's fine if that works. So you could certainly do them. You can shift the keyboard. Uh, the only trouble with shifting the keyboard, if I'm interpreting this question correctly, maybe that you increase reach distance if you're turning it, like sort of angling it uh, to face the one screen. That does work in terms of uh, setting them up directly in front of their screen. It just adds more uh, adjustments that they have to do throughout the day. So it might be something that they find that they don't do as often and something that may increase reach uh, to the sort of the, the right edge or the left edge, whichever one's pushed into the keyboards or into the cords of monitor. So hopefully I've interpreted that question correctly.
What are the disadvantages of the desktop sit-stand model, Joel? At this point, um, the disadvantages are definitely uh, definitely vary depending on the sit-stand model that you're looking at. So um, certain ones have more adjustability than others. Monitors should adjust separately from keyboard trays. So if you, uh, for example, if you had a couple different models that you were considering, I'm assuming you're may perhaps looking at these, then you may want to shoot me those examples and I can put together a quick pro and con list for each one for you uh, because I do find that the model by model, this this the answer to that question varies greatly. So, sort of overall, um, they if they go below the desk, if they are fully adjustable, um, if they're single monitor mounts, uh, if the keyboard and monitor adjust separately, um, then generally speaking, there aren't too many drawbacks to that. Uh, the only thing that I have heard from some employees. Uh, with the, for example, with the Ergotron model, because uh, one of our clients is using that exclusively, um, they, they found it pushed them back from the desk quite a ways. And so if you do need to get your keyboard to drop below the desk height, there is no way to tuck your keyboard back in, right? So a keyboard tray, typically, you can slide in underneath the desk. The ones that have a keyboard platform that goes below the desk height, you can't tuck it in anywhere because it's, it's on the arm. So it ends up being a, a challenge to get so if you work on the desk or you need to access all corners of your desk, then it does push you further away from the desktop. So that's probably one of the biggest disadvantages sort of overall of the drop below the desk model. Next question was what pathology should be present for a sit-stand workstation to be beneficial? And Shauna, it's a good question. I'm going to say I'm going to say it's a difficult one to answer as well, depending on the employee, because it isn't always dependent on their pathology. Something is dependent on the type of work that they do too, or how uh, how likely it is that they get away from their workstation versus don't. Uh, I'm trying to think of some examples of the kinds of things that we've looked at that I've recommended it for recently. So. Uh, someone who had some problems with uh, co with their coccyx, uh, I'm going to forget the terminology that they had, but like literally sitting on a donut in order to be able to sit throughout the day uh, was an extreme challenge for them. Getting So that was one of the employees that definitely prompted a sit-stand workstation. Folks have had some specific, um, I had a lady the other day who had, uh, yeah, I had, I had a good example the other day of someone who, had had some specific surgery and has had a lot of lingering effects associated with that that are not going away um, in terms of pain and discomfort. And I think probably that's a, a good sort of reference point to use is that things that uh, have things that are short term that have happened relatively recently, um, there may be some opportunity there to make changes to their workstation to improve their setup and reduce their discomfort. Folks who have had an injury from uh, often from another source. So they've had an accident or they've had some sort of surgery or something else that's going to prompt um, some significant issues with sitting, then that those are often the people that were sort of moving quickly to the sit-stand workstations. And the other folks, we I, I'm sort of, I'm going to call it a waiting game, but it's not really meant to be a game at all. It's just that if I could make some significant adjustment to your workstation, that often uh, solves the issue without having to install a sit-stand option. Another good example, actually, is call centers. It would be great to stand. That's a type of environment. 911 call centers, 911 operations rooms. Those are great, uh, great ones. There, sit stand isn't an op or standing and walking away from your desk. They don't have an opportunity to take breaks. So, a call center or something along those lines is a great option for sit stand. So. Sean, I'm not sure I answered your question really well. <laughs> if you have a specific uh, injury or something you want to talk to me about, then shoot me an email, and I'm happy to give you a call and talk about that in more detail, and I can give you sort of some ideas of whether I think it's a good fit or not. Okay, it looks like my questions are running out here. So I'll be online for a few more minutes, uh, but I don't have anything else to add to my slides today. So like I said, there will be a uh, recording of this presentation going out shortly. So all of those, um, oh, good question here is what about cardiac patients? Uh, la, that's a great question. And that for me would definitely require a doctor's note uh, because standing is going to, you're going to exert more energy while you're standing. So depending on what stage they are in their recovery, uh, standing might be a good option, uh, but if they, uh, it might also be a bad option, right? If they're having difficulty, you know, if their heart rate spikes relatively easily, if they're not sort of at the point where they can walk, 
short flights of stairs and things like that, then you may find that standing is not actually the ideal. So definitely working one up. It, so it, it could be, but it also might not be. Um, so you'll definitely want to talk to the doctor and make sure you get that information. More details about what what they're looking for uh, and provide the doctor with more details about what ask them questions like how long should they be standing for uh, how or how long that should they be out of their chair for what frequency sort of get more details rather than they should just stand because that's probably not the answer okay so like I said this will be posted online shortly and then made available to all of you we'll send you an email with all the details thanks so much for joining me today I, uh, I really appreciate your comments and questions I we knew this would be a popular one I was overwhelmed by your questions but uh, definitely made hopefully help to uh, make the session better for everyone so if you have any more I'll be on for a few minutes otherwise have a fabulous day and I will uh, hopefully see you on our next webinar